I would like, if I may, to take you on a strange journey. <laughs> I think I just did like a, a throat burp <laughs> when you were doing that. <laughs> what the fuck? I say throat burp like I drank a beer. I just like a sip of my beer and he's like... Welcome to Nine Cents. Nine Cents is a satanic perspective of our modern world, and I'm your host, Adam Campbell, being joined by the amazing, damned lucky. Jesse, how are you, my dear? I'm doing awesome, Adam. How are you doing? Not too shabby. Uh, it is great to have you and you, the listeners. It is February the 2nd, question mark as I look at my calendar. Yes, it is. And we have a fantastic show for you this week. So we're going to start this thing off with the I Dream of Jesse segment, and it's episode 10 Zombies! Ah, oh, zombies! Be afraid. Be very, very afraid. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, Infernal Informant. Two articles. The first one was sent to me by a listener. ACLU, parents of Buddhist student in North Louisiana, sue Christian educators for religious harassment. Harassment? Harassment. You ever, like, here's, here's something I want to kind of touch on. Does it bother you that whole potato potato thing? Like how some people say harassment, some people say harassment. Normally it, it doesn't phase me in the least as long as you understand what they mean. But yeah. in that that one in particular, because there's the whole sexual harassment, right? Yeah. And and so you wanna pronounce it her ass meant. I didn't I've never broken it up like that. Exactly. Exactly. That's the only oh. one I've got a, a preference on. <laughs> harassment all right well we also have an increasingly lawless presidency paul ryan blasts obama for doing the job of congress and we're going to close this thing out with an old nick peep show so before we dive in it has been a hell 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 of a week so we have two amazing uh, live shows coming up relatively soon and i would love to get some questions from you, the audience. So, on the 14th, we've penciled in for Darren Deicide, and on the 16th, we're penciled in for Jesse of I Dream of Jesse. So, any questions that you have for either of them, shoot them to me, info at 9centspodcast.com. Check out the Facebook pages. You can post them there. I'll be posting up um, on all the social networking sites that we're on, uh, Facebook, Twitter, MySpace, uh, so Satanet, um, Google+. I'm going to be doing a call for questions there. So, you can always just reply to that field uh, to get the questions um, submitted or just shoot the email as mentioned. I'm looking forward to these. I think these are going to be a lot of fun. Now we were supposed to be doing Aaron's before we did Darren's and um, Jesse's, but uh, scheduling conflicts came, you know, life gets in the way sometimes. And so we're going to keep on moving and get her uh, Aaron's episode in as soon as we can, but we have a schedule to keep. So we're going to try to keep it. Um, so yeah, I, I'm excited for this. Are you uh, are you looking forward to this at all, Jesse? Dreading it, dreading <laughs> it like a zombie apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> we have a theme for the episode: <laughs> zombie. Okay, so these are fast or slow zombie apocalypse zombies. Oh, these are definitely slow zombies. Mm -hmm. Nice, <laughs> nice. This is weird because I've always like I didn't even think that there was a question until I saw Twenty Eight Days Later. And they sort of reinvented the zombie wheel, I think. I mean, technically, I guess they weren't really zombies. They were like, it was like a, just like a blood disease. So I don't know if that's still technically a zombie yes. or not. Yeah, I see, I, I'm not like a big, yeah, as I say in my segment, I'm not a big zombie fiction fan. And I never really even thought about it because my, my introduction to zombies, and it might have been the whole experience of my zombie fiction inculcation was the uh, night of the living dead yeah and that's just so now that's that's when i think zombies that's what i think they're coming to get you barbara that's that's all i think of i, I dig that that's great and uh, we won't we won't talk about it anymore because i don't want to spoil anything up from the segment but good stuff I'm, I'm looking forward to that um oh yeah and also coming up for those of you <laughs> 
who just can't get enough nine cents because we are hitting you hard over the head with it this February. Uh, Valentine's Day Massacre Special. Now, have you heard about this, Jesse? Valentine's Day? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I don't so, know what you have planned. I don't know. So what I'm speaking of uh, specifically here is a dean from Milton Erosism and, or a den, I don't fucking know, uh, Darren from uh, Agent Provocateur, they live in the same building, basically. Um, Darren owns the building. And so I'm giving probably a little too much information away. <laughs> no one sent a bomb to that building. I need it. <laughs> I need them alive. Uh, so they're getting together. They're going to be drinking. They're going to be having probably far too many cocktails or beers since Darren is a fellow home brewer. But um, they're, they're going to give us a special, a, a Valentine's special. So it's going to mix together Milton Erosism and Agent Provocateur. And essentially, it's going to be a free flow format episode of them just waxing. I don't even know what they're going to be waxing about, to be honest. It, All I know is Darren and Aden live together and they're waxing. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I got out of that. <laughs> There's not going to be any cameras. <laughs> and that's a good thing. <laughs> We're going to find out how uh, how on the up and up this relationship between them is. <laughs> how far they both slide into each other. <laughs> as they Jesus drink. Christ. <laughs> Hey, that's what the wax is for, isn't it? They are never going to speak to either of us again. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, it's all in good fun. Uh, Okay, so look forward to that. That's going to be released on the 9th. That's next week. So I'm not going to be doing a traditional segment. We'll we'll have a couple break-ins with um, Jesse and Aaron and myself. But other than that, it's going to pretty much just be them owning the entire episode. So uh, if, if this works out... I may want to do stuff like this more often. <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> Give up the reins a little bit more, so to speak. Uh, especially if it's about waxing and sliding into guys. Oh, I don't know if you want to go give a den reins. That just sounds bad. <laughs> <laughs> this is like his regular sexual evening. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Put the bit in your mouth. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, and then obviously today is the Super Bowl. It is? Whatever the fuck that means. So I take it you don't keep up on this. Uh, I only know it's the Super Bowl because my husband was trying to get the satellite image in earlier today. <laughs> we for, for whatever reason, that's the one channel we can't get is whenever football is on. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's uh, I think that's a good thing. I, I personally detest the Super Bowl. In fact, the only thing good about the Super Bowl is are the commercials. And I only like those because I'm in the industry. And so I... I like to see creativity in action, and that's when one of the rare times you can actually see real creativity. So, yeah. I, but even then, I don't even watch the game. I have like zero interest in football. And I know to a lot of people, this means I'm not a man, whatever, so be it. I hate football. I love playing it, don't get me wrong. You, you get me out with some friends, and I will fucking have fun. But just sitting on a couch and watching it and yelling at a screen? What the fuck? What? Why? I, I just. It's wor- I I would rather like be waxing <laughs> my unit at Darren's house than fucking watching a game. So- While it then holds the reins. Yeah, no, I I um I I'm happy to say that my husband is only it's it's just Patriots football. He doesn't do basketball, he doesn't do baseball, boxing, golf, none of the other stuff for whatever reason he just likes watching the Patriots. And since they're, I guess, not in the Super Bowl, I don't honestly know who's in the Super Bowl, but I guess they're not in it, so he's not too disappointed he can't watch it tonight. Yeah. Well, it it's for the best, I think. Yeah. It's, it's the whole organization of the NFL, it's completely shady. And maybe that'll be, a, like, a focus at some point in my life if I ever decide to concern myself at all with football. <laughs> it's really <laughs> fucking corrupt. So we'll see... Uh, We'll see about that maybe for next year's episode or something. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's it's really, for me, it's all commercials. It's all creativity. And it's all, like, we go out of our way to watch a movie or to play a board game or do something else other than stare at the damn TV. And it's, it's kind of rough because obviously you have friends asking you over. 
wanted to have you, you know, come and drink with them and watch the game. And I just, it would be the most, I would be the worst company sitting in on a fucking Super Bowl game. Worst company ever. Because I would not be talking about the game. And I would be pulling their attention away from it. And it would just be like... I don't know, asking your wife to watch it with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just it. You'd probably end up talking to all the wives, and then they think you're hitting on their wives. That oh. could be a good thing. I'd, I like being surrounded by women. Maybe yeah. I should be going. What the fuck? Uh, do you want to be surrounded by women whose husbands are getting drunk in the next room? Mm-hmm. Could be a bad thing. <laughs> could be a very bad thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> good point. Well, how about we start the show with I Dream of Jesse? Sounds good. Jesse, what do you want? Well, first, Jesse, I'd, I'd I'd like you to dress me as master. I I am your master after all. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yes, master. That's better. Now look, I've got guests coming over tonight, and I want you to entertain them. What do I look like, a belly dancer? Uh, I I assume that was part. I mean, the outfit. It it kind of suggests. You may be used to dance. Listen, the gin put me in the bottle. He forgot to add the preservatives. Now, the outfit may be wrinkle-free, but what in it ain't. You don't like it? Call the number on the bottle and complain. I recently heard an interview with Max Brooks, the author of the book World War Z, in which he explained why it's important that zombies move slowly. The interview was recorded before the film adaptation had been made, so it's a bit ironic that this one element he considered so important is one of the most salient changes made in the film. But anyway, as regards the speed of zombies, it wasn't a question I'd ever considered before. Since watching Night of the Living Dead as a kid, I just think of the slow lumbering gait as being as much a part of zombieishness as wanting to eat people and not feeling pain. But Brooks asked his interviewer to imagine the difference between having a fast-moving zombie chasing after you and a slow one. If the zombie can run, you run in terror, and you find the first opportunity to kill it. If the zombie merely shuffles along as you distance yourself, you eventually let your guard down. You fall asleep, and you wake up with a zombie eating your head. The fear, which would motivate you to think and act quickly, gets replaced by an anxiety which wears you down over time. I think this observation is brilliant. Now, maybe this has always been the appeal of zombies. I wouldn't know I'm not really into zombie fiction, or at least I wasn't until I had this one little detail explained to me. And the more I think on it, the more I realize that so many scary things in life don't require my immediate attention. It seems a no-brainer sometimes to simply not deal with them until they become an issue. But then they're still there, lurking in the back of my mind, becoming visible on the horizon every so often so that I cannot ever forget they're there. The way to defeat a lumbering zombie is to walk right up to it and kill it. It's scary to do this, but the fear is the point. Fear will cause you to focus and act. Fear is not bad. Anxiety is bad. So this month... Let's kill some zombies. Take a few minutes and think of all the things you normally don't want to think about. All those scary things that are all too easy to distance yourself from due to the unlikeliness of their occurring anytime soon, if at all. Here's one idea. Find an excuse to speak in public. That gives most people the willies. I once met a lady who did a lot of public speaking as an LGBT advocate. She insisted stage fright never goes away and never gets any better, but also said that it now takes groups of a hundred or more before she gets nervous. So really, the stage fright was going away. She was just constantly pushing herself to do more. You will, on occasion, need to say something while all eyes are on you. Could be it's a toast at a friend's wedding. Could be you have to hold a meeting at work. Find a way to face the fear now so when you find out there's a lumbering zombie coming after you in the form of a business presentation you have to give, you'll already know you can handle it. Got any phobias? A snake or a spider phobia is a great one to face. You can hire a shrink to put you through what's called graduated exposure therapy, or you can just do it on your own. Now, I can personally attest to this one. It used to be I could not be in the same room as a spider once I saw it. After graduated exposure therapy, 
I actually started to get bored with this tarantula standing on my hand. No kidding. I'm not saying I wouldn't jump if a large spider suddenly came dangling down on a web a few inches from my face, but that's all I'd do. I'd jump, and then I'd be okay. Confrontation's another great thing to face. Lots of people fear confrontation. Now try not to go flying off the handle and say something stupid when you do this. Pre-plan what you're going to open with and say it a few times in private so the words come out right. You don't know what the other person is going to say in reaction. You think you know, and that's what's causing the anxiety. Maybe it'll be nothing. But even if everything you fear will happen, happens, great! Now you're experiencing the fear of a lost friendship or a broken marriage or a child who will never love you again, or maybe you're going to find out why your boss didn't give you the raise. The fear of seriously damaging the relationship will keep you focused and help you think your way through the conflict. And then the issue will stop eating you up inside like some zombie gnawing at your intestines. Along those lines, how about doing some job hunting? Try to get yourself at least one or two interviews. You don't have to take the job if you weren't interested in looking for a new one, but you get good at what you do often, so if you go job hunting before you need to, you'll be better off when you do need to. Then there's the old starting the conversation with a complete stranger who looks good enough to fuck, especially if your friends are watching. Now, I'd suggest battling this particular zombie a few times when no one's watching, but you can't properly kill it until you do it with your friends egging you on, half hoping to see you fail. And then you fail, and you get laughed at. And you walk away, and you realize that getting rejected and getting laughed at isn't as bad as it sounds. I don't know. Come up with your own anxiety-inducing scenarios. Think of this as like a reverse bucket list. Not a list of things you want to do before you die, but a list of things you hope to die before ever having to do. Am I pushing the zombie metaphor too far by suggesting the fears we easily avoid become incessant, subconscious, anxiety-inducing monsters that when they finally catch up with us will find us in a weakened state and eat our brains? Yeah, probably I am. Fuck it. I like the metaphor. And if you can think of them this way, then surely you can see that starting your own inner zombie apocalypse is probably the best thing you can do. And it'll be frightening. It'll be very frightening. But you'll be the hero of this tale in the end. Fear is good. Anxiety is bad. Now go do something scary. Here we go. Hey, what's going on for uh, in front of me. You know this is from the Times Picayune, Greater New Orleans. Uh, parents of a Buddhist student are joining forces with the American Civil Liberties Union to sue a public school board in North Louisiana, alleging their son was called stupid and given low marks for not adhering to Christian doctrine taught in his sixth grade science class. Wait, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> Christian doctrine taught in science class. It's it's we're off to a good start already. All right. Uh, Sharon and Scott Lane are the parents of three children enrolled in Sabine Parish School System in rural northwest Louisiana. In a complaint filed Wednesday, the U.S. District Court, uh, the Lanes argued their son C.C. became the target of sensation. Thank you. Um, and harassment. Harassment. Uh oh. I said that right. <laughs> by faculty and administration at Negrete High School when it became apparent he was not a Christian. All students, regardless of faith, should, be, should feel safe and welcome in our public schools, the court document said. But that is not the case in the Sabine Parish School District in Sabine Parish, Louisiana, where school officials actively inculcate Christianity and discriminate against minority faith students. The court case has already made national headlines where pundits and legal scholars are noting the uniqueness of the case as it pertains to the question of public school students' First Amendment rights. Marjorie Esman, executive director of the ACLU in Louisiana, said suits brought against the religious discrimination in public schools aren't unusual, but she thinks this case showcases a particularly extreme instance of, le- of religious harassment. This was not an instance where someone can say that it was well-intended, but perhaps misguided. Uh, the teacher or principal that wanted to make sure the kids got saved. Esmond said Wednesday, in this case, the teacher, principal, and superintendent are all complicit in religious indoctrination to the point that they engaged in public humiliation of a student of a different faith. Cece, who is of Thai descent, whoops, hang on one second, 
just had a ad pop up on me. CC, who is of Thai descent, and his legal parent, Sharon, are both Buddhists. Named as defendants in the suit are Sabine Parish School Board Superintendent Sarah Ebarb, Negrit High School Principal Jean Wright, and Rita Rourke, CC's sixth grade science teacher. During less than a month at the school in August and September of last year, the lawsuit claims Cece was told those who didn't believe in God were stupid and was given <laughs> low marks on tests when he didn't answer questions pertaining to religious doctrine. One particular question was a fill-in-the-blank statement. Now, this is all in caps with many, many exclamation points. Oh, my gosh. Isn't it amazing what the blank has made? When Cece left the blank empty, Work wrote in Lord in large red letters and marked the answer wrong. Lane say students in Work's class, in which their daughter, S.L., is also a member, get extra points for citing scripture at the bottom of tests. What the fuck? They also allege Work also skipped over the chapters in the textbook that discuss evolution. When the Lanes wrote a complaint to the letter, Prince a complaint letter to Principal Wright. They said he read it out loud over the school loudspeaker. Superintendent Ibarra, before reminding the Lanes that they were in the Bible Belt, suggested they transfer CC to another school that has more Asians, the court documents said. This is what the Lanes did, taking <laughs> CC out of Negri and enrolling him in Manny High School. Their other two children remain at Negri, where Christian paraphernalia can be found in the entryway, hallways, and classrooms, and where the Lanes said students are required to attend compulsory assemblies that feature official school prayers. The school motto, once we believe in God, that God exists, has been removed from the website and replaced with the statement that says, our students are more than just number, they are our family. The Lanes are asking for a declaratory judgment that declares the actions of the defendants unconstitutional. A preliminary, preliminary injunction ordered them to cease teaching Christian doctrine and harassing the non-Christian students in the school as well as monetary damages. In response, Ed Barb issued a statement saying the high school board had only recently become aware of the suit. A lawsuit only represents one side's allegations, and the board is disappointed that the ACLU chose to file suit without even contacting it in regards to, to the facts. The school system recognizes the rights of all students to exercise religion of their choice and will defend this lawsuit vigorously. Walter Lee, who was recently indicted on federal theft charges, represents the school board for the area. He says he hopes the parties can handle the issue outside of court. I just regret that it's a question or concern and would hope that the school officials and the parents can resolve it in a way that's acceptable to both sides, Lee said Wednesday. It would be better if they can resolve it outside the court system so the legal system doesn't have to get involved. The ACLU has also asked the U.S. Department of Education and the U.S. Department of Justice to investigate the school. A request Dina Everson of the DOJ's Civil Rights Division said is being reviewed. After the judge first assigned the case, Donald Walter recused himself. It was reassigned to Judge Elizabeth F. Foote of Shreveport, and it will be several weeks before the next steps of the case occur. <laughs> the judge recused himself? <laughs> I don't oh. want to deal with this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Insane. So the science teacher skips over evolution and is mocking and shaming non-Christian students for not believing in it. And the, like a legitimate question on the test. They even have a little uh, image here, like a scan of the test. Isn't it amazing what the blank has made? Question mark infinity. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so, I mean, is this a surprise to you that uh, someone religious like this would take over science and do this uh it's i would like to think that these things are a thing of the past but i get these constant reminders that they're not yeah i mean completely unrelated but along the same lines um one of the people i follow on twitter retweeted something i think it was sam harris and i'm not trying to name drop sam harris as somebody you should follow because i don't agree with him on a lot of things but he retweeted something that someone from one of the African nations came back to him on saying that witchcraft is real and to kill witches purifies the village. 
And I think he retweeted it for the point of, you know, if anybody's thinking, no, people don't really think that, to say, no, people really do think that. <laughs> you know, this, this belief is alive and well in the world. And that this is the same thing. This is, this is a news article telling us this belief is alive and well. You know, living here in Massachusetts, I don't see shit like this. This doesn't happen here. I don't know what it's like in Utah, but this shit does not happen in Massachusetts. <laughs> you ain't in the great state of Louisiana. I ain't in the Bible Belt. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, I mean, it, it genuinely is an expected behavior. And so if they cannot pass legislation saying that we shouldn't take, uh, teach um, evolution, we have to treat, uh, teach religion or their mock made up idea of creationism then we we just won't teach anything <laughs> and just shame those who don't believe that the lord has created earth and is amazing uh unbelievable and I, this this is the only time we've heard of it how many times are kids shamed and just don't say anything they just want to get through the class so they just write in lord on the stupid question and move about their career, never truly understanding fundamentals of evolution or science as taught by these religious fanatics. Well, now, I I would hesitate to say that if they write in Lord, they don't understand. Because if I were in this situation, and I went to Catholic school and Lutheran school, so I was in this situation, I would have written in Lord to get the A on the test. It doesn't mean I believed it doesn't mean I right, wasn't learning that's what otherwise. I'm is that the instructor, I mean, like in the article said that she skipped over the chapter of evolution. Mm. And so they don't get that information. That's so they true. They have literally that's true. no idea. And so all they know is I have to write Lord and then I've passed science. What? <laughs> and that's an oversimplification. I know. They have a scan of the, the test and you can look. It seems a bit loaded in the questions that are up here. Um, <laughs> but it's... Well, and there's an answer bank. What the fuck? But uh, well, there, there's a couple of different ways you can go with this. Because, okay, on the one hand, if you're stupid enough to only learn what's taught to you, then you deserve to only know what's taught to you. You know, that kind of increases the whole uh, stratification, which I'm not entirely against. Not that I like the idea of indoctrinating just religion and, and not teaching science because I think that's bad for society as a whole but if you look at it at the individual level if the kid is dumb enough to buy all this maybe they're not worth getting a better education to begin with but the other way to look at this which I think is even more interesting and, and I really want to hear your take on this because this family has three kids in the school they pulled one out after filing a lawsuit in which they're trying to get money, at what point is it immoral to keep your kids in a school where they're going to be religiously indoctrinated just so you can get the cash from a lawsuit? Because that's what it sounds like they're doing. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good, that's a really good point. Um because I mean, if you're if you're kind of homeschooling on the side and you know your kids are learning everything they need to know to begin with, so you're not too worried about this stuff, but you can keep them in the school and they know and you know and, and they're part of the game and they're not like just being pawns. They're kind of like, yeah, okay, I'll sit through the school and I'll I'll let you know when they said something that we can really sue over. Yeah, maybe the kids are a part of this. Is it totally but, immoral? Um. If if you're in the middle of a lawsuit, if you're trying to start a lawsuit against the school and you leave your kids in it, then it's your damn fault if they come out retarded. Um, you're leaving them in a, a, a situation that is an unknown bad situation. Uh, you're setting them up for failure. Now, that's not to say that, you know, they, I don't know if they even stated in the article um, whether the other two kids believed uh, in Christianity or not, or if it was just this one student that was a Buddhist. That's um, true. They didn't say It's entirely that. possible that that could have been the case. But without knowing, I, I just carte blanche, the parents are at fault for leaving the other two in there. But, you know, we're sort of pointing at um, behavior and, and calling it bad when I th the majority of people expect that their 
public education is is going to be an unbiased delivery of the facts, the facts as collected and set out through curriculum. Um, whether they're real facts or not is disputable. But the point is that there's a curriculum that they have to follow in the public school and that their kids will be taught that. And so it's a little unfair to say, well, if the kids don't, at sixth grade, uh, do all of you know their own research, then they're at fault. Well, at sixth grade, I, I don't see that ever happening. At, yeah, that's true. In, I, I kind of forgot what grade school, we were talking. In high school, in college, yeah. for fucking sure. But in sixth grade, that's the first year of middle school, I think. There's no way kids are going to be, you know, double checking things. They, they, I mean, most kids at that point still see authority figures. I mean, this is sort of the point where they start to stop seeing authority figures as, you know, sort of godlike creatures where they know everything and everything they do is correct. And what you, they have to do what you, you have to do what they tell you. Uh, this is sort of that breaking point where they don't do that anymore. Yeah. But you, you're taught, you you think it's true. Like you genuinely don't question. And we've talked about this with uh, um, uh, Santa before. Uh, y- your parents are teaching you things. Your instructors are teaching you things, and they they have your parents back. You think they do, you know? So why would you question? Okay, well the Lord did make everything because that's what they told me. Once you start thinking for yourself, it's a whole other ball game, and and it is your total fault if you don't look into it. But I think at this point, at this gr- grade level, and just for them to say, you know what, this is fucked up. I'm going to talk to my parents about this and I'm going to bring up a big thing. I think that's a rare occurrence. I, I genuinely think that the majority of kids in that case, like you just mentioned, would just go along with it just to get through the class yeah. because that's what they think they have to do. Yeah. Ben, sixth grade is like 11. Does that sound uh, right? 12-ish, I think. Okay. So that's still a little bit before you really come into your own. I would say 14 is when mo- most kids probably come into their own and start questioning everything. Yeah. So, yeah, you got a good point there. So it's, it's just an interesting notion. But, you know, like I said at the beginning here, this is the only one we've heard of. So we know for a fact that this is going on in more places. Um, and even here in Utah, I remember distinctly that they went out of their way to, to state when I was going through school that evolution was not truth and that it was just one suggestion and we should look at the Bible and we should look at science and make mm-hmm. our own decisions. So that was a very liberal take on it, I think, yeah. for Utah to say, you know, do your own research, but we think it was God <laughs> in <Yeah>. science. The, the, <laughs> thing I, the thing I want to say to contradict myself earlier, because um, on the one hand, it's not like I want to help all the little children of the world get a great education because I'm a nice person. On the other hand, I do want to help all the little children of the world get a great education because in 20 years, they might be my doctor, you Mm -hmm. know? And I don't want them praying for me. I want them understanding evolution. (laughs) See, and 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 I, I genuinely don't think that anyone deserves a leg up, but I think there should be equal opportunity. And if there's not equal opportunity, then we can't blame the individual for ignorance or stupidity. I mean, it's, it, it's their culture yeah, the, no, and the climate they were raised in that makes it that way. I just, I guess maybe I'm too jaded to even th- consider the fact that there might be equal opportunity in public schools or private schools. I, I just, I think if you want to do best by your kids, you have to homeschool, which of course most people can't do. Yeah. But. I, I I just don't expect as much, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, if um, if instructors follow, follow the laid out curriculum that is not religion based, and there are classes you can take that are religious courses. There's seminary and stuff here in Utah. I don't know about anywhere else. Where if you if you don't want to take one elective course, you can go to seminary for it instead. And so you know, kids who are religious or their families that make them religious, you know, they do that. Uh, but I just took an extra art class instead of going to a religious <laughs> course. But, you know, the, those classes do exist for in schools. So it's not like this is the only opportunity to indoctrinate children. Yeah. it's It takes out of what I think is the intention of public school, and that is to... Um, create a class of workers for a society that really doesn't need them anymore um and instead puts into uh their minds a class of slaves 
I, that's just how I see religious people. They are literally slaves. They do what they're told. They don't think for themselves. They believe what they're told. Hear, hear. So, and, and so it, if we have a class of slaves growing up, we have a horrible future already outlined for us. So I, I much prefer to go with a class of workers if we're not going to reform education than slaves, personally. And, and if you don't follow the curriculum, if you start indoctrinating children with religion, you are literally setting up your culture for failure. And because I'm part of that culture, i got a big fucking problem with that. <laughs> I don't care about the kids themselves unless it's mine. But just, you know, to say e equality of opportunity, why the fuck are you trying to stop them from thinking and then shaming them because they don't believe in what you believe, which is so ironic on so many levels. Like, I'm pretty sure that's exactly what Jesus said <laughs> in the New Testament. You don't believe in God? You're fucking stupid. <laughs> but uh, it could be wrong. I don't, I, I'm not a. Huge yeah, I can, I anymore. can just feel the love in that sentiment. <laughs> <laughs> it's insane. Okay. So, but this shit is out there. This shit is so out there. We, we, those of us who live in environments where we have are afforded the opportunity to be open about who and what we are and what we think and what we believe in, sometimes probably take it for granted. But there is very much portions of this country and the world much more outside this country um, where those types of individuals are shunned or acted upon violently. So you, you have to... This just tells you as an individual, as a Satanist, you have to be aware of your surroundings, of who is hearing what you're saying. You have to be smart about the way you react with the world, professionally and personally. Uh, and if you don't, then you deserve whatever's coming to you. Yeah. I mean, it's not like there's enough fucking examples warning you otherwise. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, so how about this next one here? Okay. This is the Daily Caller. An increasingly lawless presidency, Paul Ryan blasts Obama for doing the job of Congress. This was posted uh, on the 2nd of February. Hey. Wisconsin Representative Paul Ryan became the latest Republican to attack President Barack Obama over his in creed. <laughs> in creed? Do you see this? <laughs> I think it's supposed to be increased. Oh, Use okay. of executive orders. This is a... <laughs> That Someone wrote, a professional wrote this. <laughs> I have been seeing more and more typos and, and just t poor grammar in publishing over the last five years. I don't know. It's like bots write these things. It's not even human beings anymore. It's insane. It's crazy. <laughs> this is what we get with religious schooling. <laughs> in creed is what we get instead of increased. Okay, so his increased use of executive orders, calling his administration an increasingly lawless presidency that is now doing the job of Congress. The House Budget Chairman spoke with ABC's George Stephanopoulos on Sunday, which, by the way, Stephanopoulos sounds way too much like Snuffleupagus <laughs> for me to take him seriously. Like, I, I literally see him with a big fuzzy nose. Oh, like, I, I'm totally picturing a furry elephant now. <laughs> uh, with the report. And that was the other weird thing. He was crazy furry. Like, was he supposed to be a mammoth? I Yeah, I, I guess. I'm not that sure what really he was creepy. supposed to be. He looked like a furry elephant to me. But yeah, mammoth would go. Okay, uh, call to the audience here. I want to know, what do you think about Snuffleupagus? Is, it, is he a mammoth or is he an elephant? I, he kind of freaks me out now because if he's not a mammoth, he's a fucked up elephant. And if he's not an elephant, what the fuck is he? Yeah, yeah. What's this fucking Snuffleupagus? Okay, sorry. Um... The reporter asked Ryan what he thought about the president's promise during the State of the Union address to take steps without legislation to achieve his agenda. Stephanopoulos questioned why Ryan and other Republicans are upset since Obama has issued less executive orders than the previous administrations. Quote, it's not the number of executive orders, it's the scope of executive orders, Ryan maintained. It's the fact that he's actually contradicting law, like in health care, or, that's a lie, or proposing new laws without going through Congress, George, and that's a lie. Um, that's the issue. So this is a big concern. We have an increasingly lawless presidency, Ryan continued. We have an increasingly lawless president where he is actually doing the job of Congress, writing new policies and new laws without going through Congress. I wonder why. Maybe because this is the most deadbeat Congress in the history of Congress? Maybe? Presidents don't write laws. Congress does. And when he... No, he, that's not true. Congress doesn't. And that's been proven through this Congress. And when he does things like... I'm sorry. I'm, you can tell I'm biased with uh, Paul Ryan here. And when he does things like what he did in healthcare, 
delaying mandates that the law said was supposed to occur when they were supposed to occur. That's not his job, which he delayed because his Paul Ryan's party uh, demanded that he did. Uh, the job of Congress is to change laws if he doesn't like them, not the president. <clears throat> Ryan laughed off Stephanopoulos' suggestion that if the president is truly so lawless, the Jews' P should move to impeach. Some of these are going to get fought over in court, he noted, but I am concerned about this trend, such as what he said at the State of the Union, that if Congress doesn't give me the law I want, I'm going to go do it myself. That's effectively what he said. That's not the way our Constitution works. I think these executive orders are creating a dangerous trend that is contrary to the Constitution. Ryan also touched on immigration reform, which appears to be gaining traction among Republican leadership. He didn't deny a deal with Obama and congressional Democrats may be in the works, but promised any bill would reject outright amnesty and focus on border security. Quote, here's the issue that all Republicans agree on. We don't trust the president to enforce the law, he said. Security provisions have to be in law, in practice and independently verified before the rest of the law can occur. So it's a security first, non, non amnesty approach. Okay, before we enter commentary. <laughs> I, I, no, no, I have to, because I might have misheard you, and we won't know until we play it back and listen to it, but I'm pretty sure you pronounced GOP as the Jewish P. No fucking way did I say Jewish P. I think you said the Jewish P. <laughs> <laughs> I have been dying for the last minute. <laughs> Is this a her ass Mint thing. It might be. It might be. I maybe I heard it wrong. It maybe it's all in my head. Maybe the I'm anti-Semitic. Maybe peace. I'm anti-urine. I don't know. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Uh, I well, either way, I meant to say you. <laughs> I don't think I said you. Uh, we'll find out. Okay, so here's the deal. Um, is this wildly ironic, or does Paul Ryan have a point? Oh, we we are so far apart on this one. <laughs> I guess I guess the only point I can try to make that I have any hope of you possibly agreeing with would be if I say that even if this is the most incompetent Congress we've ever had and the most competent president we've ever had. Oh, I wouldn't say that. But even if it was, to allow the president to make laws when that's Congress's job increases the power of the presidency, which is going to pass to somebody else's hand in a few years. And so I, I would caution anyone on giving power to the presidency just because of who's president. No matter how wonder, I don't care if it's, if it's Peter Gilmore gets elected as president, I would not give him additional powers because that's going to pass to the next guy. And that's not I, what the founding... I totally agree with you. Okay, so that's that's the only thing I think you and I might agree on on this whole thing. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. But I mean, it does need to be stated that executive orders are normal. Presidents have always had that power and have been doing them, like creating executive orders for, you know, presidents throughout history have always been done. it. Um, and then the next president who comes into office can cancel them and have, um, through history, canceled the previous president's executive orders. So it's not like they're giving him or he's taking authority that he doesn't have. He's doing what he can legally. And that's why when he increased the, um, the minimum wage, he only did it through government uh, employees. Because by law, he can't do it without Congress passing it for anyone but public employees. Uh, I'm sorry, government employees. And so, he, you know, he, he is bound within certain confines, and he's not going out of that. So the suggestion of Paul Ryan saying that he's writing laws uh, without Congress is only partly true. He's doing what he can within the law without Congress because Congress refuses to do anything. And, and that's not an opinion. That, well, that's a historical fact. Well, even, even if Congress refuses to do anything, what about when the health care law came through and nobody had read it and they said we have to pass it so that we can read it? I believe it was but Nancy the, Pelosi that said that. That's, that's not a one-time thing. Um, and so I do I, – I agree with the – I believe the foundation of your statement that – we should have representatives that read the fucking laws before they fucking pass them and stop being retarded. <clears throat> but the but reality is, is that's happened throughout all of history. I mean, the Patriot Act is the most recent uh, before the health care uh, reform of that exact thing. Uh, President Bush 
demanded that we have to have these absolute powers in the Patriot Act. No one read it, and so everyone did it. And now we have the NSA spying uh, with legal authority because of the Patriot Act. We have um, uh, right, so a Bill you, of Rights being taken away for being deemed a terrorist. So if you I can mean, agree that the Patriot Act was done badly, can you agree that the Health Care Act was done badly? Yes. Yes, I can. Absolutely. Um, I think there was... The, the pro I mean, uh, see, we're, we're sort of losing the scope of this article, but the I believe that the Health Care Act went bad um, because it was fought for the wrong reason. Like, the, 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 the correct fight wasn't being fought. It should have been for um, uh, a single-payer system, not for uh, um, insurance companies. But but see where I'm going with this, which is actually what what Paul Ryan is talking about, is the way that it was passed. He wrote it and he strong armed the Congress into doing it. I'm not saying he's unusual in doing that. That's not my point. Because as you pointed out, Bush did the same thing with the Patriot Act. It's not. It's become normal for the president to strong arm the Congress into doing something, to voting for something that they haven't even read. And it's very dangerous that that's become normal with the last two presidents at least and, and maybe presidents before them. That should not ever happen. Right, but we can't blame the presidency for that because the president isn't the one that passed the law. The Congress did. So if the Congress is passing laws and then complaining about the passing of them laws, then who is to blame? You know what I mean? I mean, we can't we can't blame any president, Bush or uh, Obama, for yeah, the law being passed when they, like, the Congress passed it. Yeah, like, that's a fair point. The Congress is at fault. They didn't read it. They passed it. They realized what was in it, and they got pissed. Well, do your fucking job and read. Like, why are you why are you blaming the president for trying to push his agenda, no matter who the president is? Of course he's going to do that. That's why he's in the fucking office. Well, I like, would... I I suspect that there are reasons that we don't know about why the Congress did what it did. And I, that's not to excuse them. It's just I suspect that the, whatever the reasons are, are pretty bad. I, I mean, like, I don't know if people's lives were threatened if it was that bad kind of a thing. But, you know, will you ever get money from the people who have been funding your campaigns up until now maybe that'll all be cut off I, I don't know I just think that there had to have been a reason that so many people voted for something that they were told they couldn't read until they voted for it that just oh, that, it kind of goes see, against what you just said though that they couldn't read before they voted for it I, I do not believe is it true okay. they did have the law beforehand it was just pe most people saw it and it was so big that they didn't bother Okay, it was I mean, my understanding that, that it wasn't even disclosed until they had after they, they after they had voted for it. I may be wrong about that. If if it's right, this is the first time I'm hearing about it, and that is I'm on your side if that's the case. That's fucked up. That's completely wrong. That should never, ever, ever happen. Um but I mean that's not what I was led to believe early on when this was being a battle being fought. People were complaining about the size of it. Mm. And I, I particularly remember fucking Palin retarded woman. Speaking like, speaking, how can anyone read anything so large? You know, coming from a woman who's never read in her life, <laughs> <laughs> of course. But, um, yeah, and I'm sure, I mean, it, it's it's nowhere near where it needs to be. It's it's full of, I'm sure, additional pointless uh, points of legislation. And, I mean, in the long run, who knows? It's projected to save money, but who knows if that's going to actually happen until it does. Uh, but it's, again, like, just to your point, what you were saying, um, who was leaning on them and for what reasons? So if it was about money, well, their donors are corporations. So it would be insurance lobbyists that were leaning on them to pass it, which would make perfect sense because the only people that benefit from this are insurance agencies. Th if you mandate that everyone has to have health care, who are they getting the health care from? Fucking insurance agencies. Right. So, of course, it's like guaranteed money. They're going to lean on these fucking congressmen to pass this bill that is in their best interest because it gives them tons of fucking money. And the, um, and the way that they did the whole everyone has to have it, but some people still fall to the state for payments means that the insurance companies now pick the healthiest and leave the worst for the state and you make even more money. Yeah, I mean, it's I, state by state. I couldn't speak to specifics, but 
if if it just went to a single pair, it would have been so much better for everyone involved. I think my own uneducated opinion there. Um, but this, you know, this is the way that laws are passed: is you have lobbyists threatening or incentivizing through money to pass a law that is in the uh, best interest of that corporation. And this is what happens when you have money in politics. You don't have a representative base speaking about their constituents' wants. It, it's representatives speaking about what they want and the money that they're going to get. Uh, I mean, and, and you can sort of roll this back to education in that if you don't have a good education, if you don't have equality of opportunity, then you will never be able to break through that barrier and be one of the representatives either. And I'm not talking about a greater good or anything, but if you're going to go in your best interest, at least in our society, what makes America should be what your constituents want. And that doesn't mean what the country wants. And so you do see some people with Tea Party enthusiasts, for example, doing this, where they're speaking to their constituents and they're behaving exactly the way they want them to, for good or bad. But it does happen in small, small ways. But when you're talking about major parties, a Republican and Democrat, it it's not about your constituents. In the majority of cases, it is just about the corporations that had got them into office. In my opinion, that's a bad thing. So we can't, I guess my point is, we can't point at the, the president because he doesn't pass laws. The only way he does executive orders is through law. And so for Paul Ryan to, to point at him saying that, he's taking over the job of Congress is completely inaccurate. He's doing what he can because Congress will not, but he's not going above and beyond the law, the boundary of law to do it. Um, so I don't know, you know, it's just another thing to, to flame. And, and here's like the worst part. I feel like I have to defend a president who I don't want to fucking defend because there's idiots like this who are just throwing fucking one line taggers out there, distorting truth. Like, I, I don't like Obama's policies more than any other president I've ever, you know, lived under. Um, and in fact, I detest some of them to my core. But I, you can't just sit back and say all things are equal when you have a fucking Congress not doing shit and then complaining when someone's trying to. I don't know. Um, I am more than willing to hear any counter arguments of yours, whether I agree or not. Well, it's interesting when you pull the two stories together, because in terms of education, you can send your kids to a private school or you can take what the state gives for free. And now in terms of health care, you can buy something from a private company or you can take what the government gives for free, for free. And a lot of people wanted to go with the single payer health plan. And I'm not saying that's a bad idea. I to my mind, it would have been better to either go single payer or get the government out of it entirely. But it's the mixed bag that kind of fucks things up. And so now I'm looking at education the same way. Would we be better off to either only have state schools or close down the public school system altogether? You either put your kid in a private school or you homeschool. Well, I, I know I like I've been looking at, at private schools for my son, actually, because he's he's getting to the age where it would be relevant for him. And the grades, uh, the ranking, the, the, the public ranking uh, by local newspapers of the school's um, progress, I guess, you know, sort of the grade level of each, um, whether or not they're actually benefiting the students. Public schools were better than the private schools. Yeah, but okay. Let that's me, just in Salt Lake. So I don't mind choice. I don't mind keeping well, public schools and keeping private schools and letting people do what they think is best. Let, let me put this a different way. If you were buying health care and you bought it through Aetna versus going on Medicare, you would buy it through Aetna and pay for it with the assumption that it's going to be better than what you could get through Medicare. Otherwise, why pay for it? So the same principle now apply to schools. You might put your kid through first Lutheran High School versus Salt Lake City High School because you expect that first Lutheran is going to pay, is going to be a better education because you're paying for it. But then another 
family comes along and says, hey, wait a minute, the Campbells are getting better at education at the Lutheran school where my kid isn't getting it public school, I demand that the public school increase in order to be competitive with the private schools. But then why pay more for the private schools? That's where I think it gets a little fucked up. Some people are paying for additional services, and then the people taking the free services are saying, no, it should all be equal. I'm not sure what the answer to this is, but I think that's where it gets fucked up. See, I, I think we're, I think we have different ideas about what this is. Um, healthcare.gov does not give you healthcare for free. Like you still have to pay for it. Like no one gets free healthcare. I mean, yeah, the but, only people that get free healthcare are, are people who do qualify for Medicaid and Medicare. And that's because they have like problems, like like health problems that they can't work or well, you know for whatever reason. Well, no, no, let me stop you there because pe nobody gets free healthcare because taxes are paying for the Medicare. Whereas members are paying for the private. Right. But any, anyone who falls under this new healthcare law in, in America for the states that are still, you know, going with it, they all still have to pay for their own medical care. That, that's the point is that everyone pays for their medical care. That, that was the point of the reorganization of the whole thing is that everyone pays. So no one is footed with the bill. The taxpayers aren't footed with the bill. And so Medicaid and Medicare are there. Uh, that's not for the public. The only people that don't pay for their health care are the people who work in Congress and the president. OK, so what's the difference between getting your health care through Medicare and getting it through Aetna? The difference is whether or not it's going to be subsidized through the government because of the health care law. So, but so what, why would you care? Why would you? Why would you care? Because if if there's regulations over uh, health care costs, because it's overseen by a government organization, then your rates can't be jacked up. You can't be denied coverage, you um, for whatever reason, and uh, your children are allowed to stay on your health care longer. Like that's that that was the point of it. Yeah, but that would apply to both Aetna and Medicare. Well, it applies to anyone in any state that that is going along with the. The healthcare change. Right. So where's the added value in buying your health care from Aetna versus Medicare? If your state is following through with it, it's the regulations guaranteeing that it's not going to like go crazy. Right. So it's no longer Aetna no longer has any value in what they're selling. It's the same as what the state offers. I don't think I understand what you're saying. To be it, in in the old model before Obamacare, which I'm not saying in a condescending way, I'm just calling it that. Aetna offered better than Medicare, but with the way the in regulation state? in any state. That's that. I mean, that's a blanket statement that we can't verify. Okay, well, they it, it wasn't exactly the same. The rules were different. Now they're trying to make the rules all the same. So what's to make somebody want to get their insurance through Aetna versus just getting it through the state. How is Aetna as a business going to compete with that? Well, hold on, hold on. No one's getting it through the state. And, and I think this is the big misunderstanding that a lot of people are having. And, and this is just m my understanding of it, is that if your state is cooperating with uh, the government health care reform, and not all states are, but if they are, they are given money to help expand Medicaid and Medicare. And at the same time, any health organization, any insurance agency in that state has to follow the regulations of that health care reform. That, so if you're in the state and your state says, we will take that additional health care money, thank you, along with all of those regulations, then there isn't an option. And people are losing health care because of that. Because the regulations that those uh, the state is imposing on the insurance agencies is better than what the insurance agency was able to do. So instead of saying, if I'm an insurance agency, if I'm Aetna in Massachusetts, for example, and I'm saying, I want to be able to not have any regulation, um, then you're going to have to convince the state not to go along with this health care reform. If they do, then you have to meet the standards of that healthcare law, or you can't do business in that state. And so you do see people like insurance agencies going under 
but that's because that they don't want to go along with the reforms and the, or they can't afford it meaning they can't take in the cancer patients because they can't afford it they can't take in um the children for extra years because they can't afford it so it's not like i mean i actually have Aetna personally it's not like Aetna is being docked at all it just means that they have to meet the requirements that the state is telling them to meet because the state took those extra federal monies for medicare and medicaid expansion I mean, so it's not like you're in Massachusetts and you can say, well, no, I can either do the public Aetna or I can do the state. The state doesn't give you anything. Even if you get your health care through a state um, website or a state program, it's still from a private corporation like Aetna. Well, no, it could, be, it could be Medicare. You can't get your health care through Medicare unless you're part of the government or you're, you're like, like you're crazy sick or you, you're old or. No, you, like you, you have just to have to be poor. You just have to be poor to get it. Right, right. Or you can't afford it in any way. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. But then you're not going to be shopping anyway because you can't afford it. It's just now the state picks you up. And that's what those those extra funds that the government, the federal government are pushing into it, that's sort of the benefit is that they're able to cover more people. The, the federal government for the first, I believe it's four years or something like that, is picking up the bill in the hopes that the more people who sign up for uh, regular insurance will then offset through taxes what the state or I'm sorry, what the federal government was giving them as a bonus and they won't have to do that anymore. And they can just keep those programs themselves and pay for them themselves. Um, wow. We, we totally. <laughs> from this. Um, either way, fantastic conversation and no one should believe what I say or what anyone else says. I mean, Look yeah, in, ca in, in case I came off as being pro insurance companies, I am not at all. At <laughs> all. I would rather do away with insurance altogether. You're in the pocket of big money. <laughs> Pay as you go. And I say that as someone who's made their life, every, almost every dollar I've earned has been in the healthcare industry, and I would rather see it all go to hell. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> all right. Well, how about we jump into a little bit of. Old Nick Peep Show. Sounds good. Welcome to another Old Nick Peep Show, the only segment that delivers beautiful women, masculine men, and intriguing information on all things Old Nick. Joining us, as always, is the first Old Nick chick, which Marilyn Mansfield and her handsome beau, senior editor, Warlock Zothamog. How are you both? Hello, Adam. How are you? Hey, Adam. We're doing well. Thank you. Fantastic. I am fabulous. Uh, you guys uh, enjoying the game, or are you skipping it? No, we're, we're, we're not supportive, really. <laughs> <laughs> we're watching the zombie bowl uh oh, Dead nice. marathon <laughs> <laughs> sweet yeah yeah we're, we're not into pool or anything i mean you know <laughs> nice i don't i'm i'm not really a big uh, football guy myself <laughs> yeah i'm not much All of right. a spectator so i've never got it yeah yeah that's the big thing i mean i think that's what separates some people is is either you love to watch and cheer and sort of be behind something or you'd prefer just to do it yourself right right yeah you know, I don't know. We we just that's one of the things, you know, that attracted me to him was he wasn't into sports really, you know. <laughs> Cuz I I, really, I mean, I like boxing, but like, you know, I I don't get into the whole ball and baseball or football and I don't know, I'm I'm a real girl, girly girl. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, let's talk a little old Nick. So, last time we spoke, I was ah, speaking yeah. with Zoth and, and uh, the new issue was going to be coming out and it has. So what do we have this time? The reason for this new issue was that um, Bob Johnson was getting inquiries about how people can see Marilyn Mansfield's photo shoot again and the 6606 um, Alter Girl. And what he thought of would be a great idea would be to re-release this classic issue, but revisit it in a way where we can redo it and make it a little different by also including a new centerfold, uh, the Scarlet Black. Nice. Um, now, I picked up this digitally, and it looks amazing. So, um, 
I mean, the the first time you did the uh, Old Nick Magazine did the six six oh six episode, it was limited, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes, it was. And and now this too will also be a limited edition. Um, th- this is the first time we've done a classic issue. So we'll probably end up seeing these happening again in the near future. But this is the first classic. So, you know, get them while they're hot. <laughs> nice. So is this a situation where you're only going to limit the classic versions of the magazine, but you'll still be able to get uh, some of the, like the original old older versions? Um, yes, yes. You, you'll be able to get the older versions, you know, up until uh, a certain amount, a certain quantity, rather. And the same thing with the classic issue. There will be a, a certain cla- uh, quantity where it will be a cutoff point. So you do want to get wow. these, you know, before they sell out. Yeah, and they're, they're collector's issues, so. Yeah, I it is an interesting <laughs> thought because, I mean, you, I mean this is, this is a, a physical collector edition issue that's limited. But correct me if I'm wrong, but can you still get the digital versions? Um, yes, you will still be able to get the digital versions, but, you know, once again, I believe the idea is to limit the amount of, you know, like to have a certain cutoff point. I I like that for a number of reasons. I mean, one, it hopefully, you know, those of us who are are huge fans of the magazine, there's, you know, it's nice to know that, that you were there at the time that it was available and that you could pick it up. And now it is only those who were paying attention that now have access to the, the content therein. Um, that That's pretty exciting from a collector's standpoint. And it's also nice to think that in the future, and, the, and you actually see this in any type of media. I mean, movies, you know, cult favorite movies and magazines and uh, comics even where there's a limited run and it's not available anymore and then they'll come out and release it with a, a couple updates or a couple different changes and stuff so it, it's nice to see that old nick is is using that same formula which adds a little bit of an added value to the individual uh you know that is a collector yeah rather absolutely than, yeah yeah rather than just saying well everything's available all the time and you know what, in 20 years, you can still, you know, go back and get the first issue. And, uh, you know, it's, I don't know, it, it doesn't have that, the exclusivity portion of it that, that is so important to a lot of people, uh, myself included. So that, that's really nice. Um, for those who may have uh, not seen or not experienced the first issue, what can they find in this uh, 6606 uh, classic edition? Um, well, like I mentioned before, it does have the lovely Marilyn Mansfield in it. Very nice. There's, you know, her, that was her first shoot for Old Nick, right? Yeah, that her was, that was, yeah. um, special to me. It was very flattering that, you know, people were, um, you know, asking about it to bring it back and things because that was my debut, um, for Old Nick. And, um, you know, it came out after I went to LA and promoted the magazine um, with Bob in Hollywood, which was really exciting. So, you know, it, it holds a special place in, in my heart, you know. So um, we put a lot of work into that shoot. I think I mentioned before it was about nine hours, that shoot, right? I love the way it came With out, the fireplace. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, I mean, it's, it's... Well, besides Marilyn, we also have our high priest, Magus Gilmore, He's featured in this um, section called Antiheroes, under which we are we ask him 13 questions. And he was so gracious enough to answer them all. We also have um, an article that I wrote in here, um, a little uh, deviation from my usual music reviews. These were um, what I focused on in this article was French horror, because the French were actually one of the first people to ever have horror movies. And I go back and I review three of my favorite um, horror movies in there. And there's, um, you know, the section of vices, the anti-abstinence. We talk about cigars. We have wisdom from the world's great lovers, from, you know, a little bit from Lord Byron and Casanova and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, you know, and of course, there's the girls that are always featured in the magazines. Um, Gotta love you know, that. Selena Minx does her sex magic, and of course, you know, the 6606 exclusive altar girl photos. Those are great. 
that was yeah that, that, that was a really really fantastic uh, shoot with the, <laughs> uh, the, the altar girl that was amazing is there you know for going forward um, with the COS if there are other public events is this something that old Nick is going to try to do uh, maybe do a feature um, with images like you did with the 6606 altar girl I definitely think so. Yeah, I mean, we did the um, the Black House uh, uh, issue, you know. Yeah, that was cool. So, yeah, and we had, you know, um, that was something that we did with, you know, a bunch of us uh, got together and did that, which was amazing, you know. Um, yeah, I, I think that that's something that, you know, is is very um, appealing to, to the readers as, as well. And it also gets other members involved in the magazine, you know, to be featured and, and such. As you know, the Black House issue, you know, had a lot of other mm-hmm. members in there, which is really great. And they, you know, it's just, it's, it's kind of like, you know, a, um, a a shared experience for everyone to come together and, you know. Yeah, well, if, if and when the COS would decide to do another public um, demonstration like that, Old Nick would yeah. definitely be there. Yeah. You can just count on that. Yeah. Nice. We'll be, yeah, we'll, we'll <laughs> yeah, be there. <laughs> Very cool. And, you know, and obviously, you know, there's a lot of people who just aren't able to participate uh, for one reason or another. And so it's nice to be able to uh, sort of be a fly on the wall through old Nick's eyes. Uh, I mean, <laughs> who's, who's better eyes to be a fly on the wall through? Uh, yeah. It's nice to be able to you know, you know, experience it in some way. Plus, it's like a great way to, you know, remember the event, you know. So, I mean. Yeah, absolutely. Those, those are the, like some of the, I think they're the most popular issues when, you know, when, when, uh, events are included, things like that. You Absolutely. Know? So yeah. people really enjoy, enjoy that feature. Um, so one okay. last thing before we close it out here, uh, I mean, it's a new, it's a, a, a classic release of the original version, but as you've already mentioned, it's a new centerfold. So what was the reason behind that? Um, I think Bob just wanted to add, you know, something, not not reissue the same exact thing, but, you know, uh, change it up a little bit, you know, um, just to... Just like um, you mentioned yeah, before, you know, you know to, to, yeah. to give it a new spin to it, to right. give it a little added extra value to the collector. Yeah. Right. So, you know, it has a little bit of... Um, it's it's the same, but it's not the same. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and you get no arguments from me because I I really loved the the photo shoot that came out of it. The the centerfold is amazing, and uh, I think it's a fantastic issue. Uh, so it was really nice to see it released um, as it was, but with a little bit extra, a little bit right. of uh, <laughs> a Something little bit new. of love. Something in the new. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. Well, next time uh, we speak, I, I think I would like to talk to you, Marilyn, a little bit more about uh, maybe a little bit more about uh, your first shoot with Old Nick and, and what that experience was like. So uh, if you're open to it, maybe we can talk about that a little bit next month. Oh, yeah, sure. That'll be great. Cool. Well, that's going to have to do it for this Old Nick's Peep Show. Um, once again, uh, we know this segment's never enough, but you can uncover Old Nick content online. So... Uh, Marilyn and Zoth, where can the audience find Old Nick online? Um, well, there's the site, of course, oldnickmagazine.com. You can follow us on Twitter um, at Old Nick Magazine, and then you can follow me at uh, Old Nick Chick. Um, as always, there is great ad deals going on. If you want to promote yourself, your business, your band, whatever have you, there are really great ad specials and, you know, um, you reach a lot of uh, consumers and things. Um, anything else? Uh, you, if you're interested in ad space, you can always write to us at info at oldnickmagazine.com. Mm-hmm. Of course, we're on Facebook, and we just recently made a Pinterest page. Mm-hmm. For those of you on Pinterest and want to pin some of our photos, look for Old Nick Magazine there. And any girls interested in modeling should submit photos to info at oldnickmagazine.com. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> you know what? I, I was going to end it right there, but your last little statement there got me curious. I know that this is a gentleman's magazine. <laughs> is there any, do you think there's ever any, any way that there's ever going to be like a spinoff, 
maybe Miss Old Nick or something where it's like, you know, for the, for the girls out there or, or uh, maybe for the uh, 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 homosexual men out there uh, to you, see a male know, I, version of this. You know, you're not the first one to, to say that, actually. Didn't we have a conversation with Bob yeah. about this? Yeah. Kind of like, a, you know, like how they did Playgirl or whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know. I think I think maybe we should um, talk, talk to, to Bob about yeah, that. Yeah, you know, because it is... Hey, I wouldn't mind it. I'll tell you that. <laughs> what what kind of the COS? I don't know. Whoever you know, you know, find you guys. Male models, uh, yeah. Well, uh, so hey, I, I would like. It. <laughs> <I'm really sure. laughs> nice. I wouldn't mind it at all. I got I got a few images in my head right now. At least. At least. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, thank you both very much for your time. I really appreciate it. And uh, definitely, audience, check out the magazine. Check out the new issue. Uh, you'll not be disappointed. Until next time, hail Satan. Hail Satan. Hail Satan. All right, that's going to do it for another show. We hope you enjoyed it, and we would love to hear from you. Jesse, tell the people, tell the good listeners how they can reach out to you. I am damned lucky on Twitter, and my blog is uh, Drafts from a Satanic Windbag at WordPress.com. And damn lucky in life, too. I am. Yeah. Visit the website 9centspodcast.com and send your correspondence to info at 9centspodcast.com. And let me remind you guys, if you want to ask Jesse any question under the sun, anything even the dirt of dirt of stuff i can't promise you'll answer but you can ask uh send me a <laughs> send me your questions <laughs> plural to info at nine cents podcast.com and make sure you tune in to see her lovely face and answering your crazy questions probably <laughs> so <laughs> or uh, poking at fun at you for asking <laughs> Uh, let us know if any suggestions, critiques, corrections, or general comments you might have. I know everyone who listens to the show loves Jesse. They love you. They love your voice. They love Aww. your segment. And they Aww. love your arguing with me. I know that for a fucking I, fact. I've gotten it from far too many people not to believe it. And how many of them want to harass me? That's what I want. <laughs> I don't think any. I think <laughs> I think more people agree with you than they do me. Um, but I want right, to be harassed. Listen. <laughs> okay <laughs> harass jesse everyone get on her blog and just send her fucking uh her ass mint pics <laughs> you can visit the satan at facebook google plus twitter or myspace page for nine cents to get updated on weekly topics download the show monday nights via my rss feed found at nine cents podcast.com we're also on last fm stitcher spotify and youtube so look for us there you can subscribe to nine cents via itunes by searching nine cents and don't forget to leave a rating and or comment if you'd like to learn more about the Church of Satan, visit churchofsatan.com. And remember, the only way this podcast is going to continue is if you share it with a friend. Do us a solid, people. Help spread the word. Once again, thank you for joining me. And as always, I'm your host, Adam Campbell, being joined by... Jesse. And until next week, hail Satan. Hail Satan. Hail Satan.